talk about like like oh I'm moving to LA like this things are looking great and the band's doing well and like this this is so rad from like the the kid that was like sitting in his room in the burbs like you know hoping to maybe play in a band one day is like some somehow I'm like in a, in Los Angeles now in a touring band and you know uh, and then it was just like bloop. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set, where each week we explore the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. You're hearing The Tundra by Pelican, featuring my guest, Larry Herwig, on drums. Pelican formed in Chicago in 2001, and Larry's commanding presence compels and defines the band's dense, long-form compositions. Aside from his work in Pelican, Larry also plays in Interceptor and has a second career as a real estate agent. I spoke to him in downtown Los Angeles. And now my conversation with Larry Herwig. My first band uh, was called Tusk. It was like a kind of like a hardcore grindcore band um, with guys from Pelican, and um, we we played a lot of our early shows at the Fireside Bowl, and um, we're just friendly with with Brian, um, you know. And he was he was booking shows even out in the suburbs. He had a place out in like Elgin, and I think it's called like the Third Floor. But um, anyway, so we we started playing. Um, another band on the side, Pelican, obviously I was like exploring kind of the slower, like re- more repetitive kind of side of music where like Tusk was just like really fast and hectic and blast beats and all that. And, um, at that time, I mean, according to Brian, he's just like, Oh, I don't have any like stoner rock bands to play the high end fire show. Do you guys want to play? And we're like, yeah, of course. And that was our first show. And, uh, we had like four songs written and, uh, I have a recording of it. It's how it's long pretty was rough. the set? Um, so then, I think th- I think three of the four songs ended up on our demo, and like I think our demo was like just shy of a half hour. Oh, so they were longer songs. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's like kind of a perfect length for an opening slot, then. Yeah, but we were we were like so nervous. I mean, <laughs> we were essentially like still still like twenty year olds and um, didn't know if we wanted to be a vocalist band. Um, just didn't know how people were going to react and it's like, well, let's give it a shot. So that was our first show. And how it, did it feel? Um, it felt good because people, people stayed and watched. Whereas like with Tusk, it was like, um, a little more, I don't want to say confrontational, but it was just like pretty negative and just like, um, not for everybody. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, people just would walk away or just not their thing. And then Pelican was like, kind of after that first show, it was like people already kind of like, oh, this is cool. And like, it was a, a fresh thing we weren't used to as a band. Um, we were used to kind of maybe a couple people would dig it, you know? So what, when you think about that nervous feeling you had, yeah. when was the last time you've had that feeling? I still get, I mean, that was particularly nervous. Um, but I still, I still get nervous before some shows. Um, it's a good feeling in a way. Yeah. I think it, I think it keeps you on your toes kind of, um, I don't know. I just feel like if you're, if you're too overconfident, stuff can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a, it's like a nervous energy and I think it comes from a good place where you want to, you want to perform well and you want to do your, do your best. Um, you know, so it's, you're, you're kind of putting yourself on the, out, out there for people to, to see and, and listen to. And it's like, I, want it to be good you know i'm not making music to um you know bum people out or you know 
not like us. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, I understand it's part of like being in a band or music is like, yeah, there's a very, there's a very good chance people won't like it, but you know what I'm saying? I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like, um, you care nerd- about it. You exactly. care about it. And you want other people to feel the way you're feeling. Yeah. Well, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Des Plaines, Illinois, which is like a suburb of Chicago. Um, pretty close to O'Hare. And, uh, Lived there till I was about 19, then moved to the city, Chicago. Um, what were your parents into? Um, my dad was, still is, into art. Um, he just illustrated his first kid's book. As, he just retired, um, I guess it was about two years ago now. And uh, he um, he did a book with um, Paul Meineke. Meineke. He's like, he was like a famous Chicago um, news broadcaster. So it was, it's so pretty cool. Paul wrote the book and your dad illustrated yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. They were like friends and he asked my dad to do it. So it was like his first um, book he did. But he went to art school like when he was younger and then he got At into- the Chicago Art Institute? No, he went to Northern uh, in DeKalb mm-hmm. and um, got an art degree. And then um, he got into advertising. Mm-hmm. And he did that for a while. And then I think it was just- really long hours um you know back then it was like you know the 70s and like they're still drawing cereal boxes by hand and you know it's before like computers kind of took over so yeah um just very um tedious perfectionist work you know he'd be at the the office 12 hours you know he'd take the last train back from chicago at you know midnight so i think he i think he felt he was missing out um on uh family life a little bit so then he he started a different company with my um with his sister's husband his uh, brother-in-law and it was like home improvement type things and they did that for like 25 years oh wow yeah and that was an, uh, another level of stress because he was like running his own company mm-hmm. and it has it had its ups and downs and then <clears throat> he ended up working at home depot for like the last couple of years and then he just retired and he's happy he's stoked he's you know, like i said he's, he's drawing again he's got time to do his art and um, my mom, you know, she, it's me and my brother. So she, she, she was kind of stay at home mom, raised the two of us. Um, and both into music, you what know, kind of music would they put on? Um, they would play a lot. I mean, a lot of the classic stuff like the Beatles, Zeppelin, um, you know, they, they would just have the classic, cla- classic rock on kind of constantly. Um, it's kind of why I don't, I don't like really like the Beatles very much. I know that's like blasphemy, but I think it was just I heard it so many times uh, growing up. And I, Zeppelin, obviously, I really, really like. Um, when did you start hearing the drums rather than hearing the whole song? Um, I was probably when I was like a teenager. I think it was... Um, I was trying to go back in my mind thinking thinking about timelines and stuff. And it was probably like early early teenage years when I would just start to just starting to discover more music and um wanting to go to shows but like parents didn't really want me to go to shows till I was like almost like 15 or 16 you know because they were worried I was gonna like hang out with the wrong crowd and get into stuff and um but it was like you know you know growing up in the in the um early 90s it was like the only way to really find out about bands was um maybe Headbangers Ball or 120 Minutes or you know, if I could hear something on the radio. I mean, I would try to catch, I I can't remember, I was trying to remember the name of the the Sunday night show that would play underground music. That was 120 minutes, right? Well, that was, that was MTV, but there was something in Chicago where you could tune in on the radio. Oh. And it was like, it was, it usually tended to be heavy, like metal and like grunge and stuff, but it was just stuff you couldn't, you wouldn't hear on like normal radio. And it was only on like Sunday nights from like, nine to 11. So I used to like, I remember like having a tape recorder and like taping songs I liked and, you know, and then like, what kind of stuff were you recording? (laughs) Um, I mean, it was most likely like, you know, like some of the classic thrash stuff like Anthrax, Metallica, Slayer, Megadeth, you know, that was kind of like gateway, you know, even like first Guns N' Roses record was mm-hmm. deaf. I mean, even Def Leppard when I was like in sixth grade, it was like my favorite band. Did you ever see Def Leppard? 
I wish, but no. I saw him in like 92. Yeah. How was it? It was pretty cool. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Um, and I wasn't even a big Def Leppard fan, but I, like, I think one of my friends had a ticket, so I went along. It was Yeah. Yeah. I think pretty much every concert that I saw when I was 12 was amazing. Yeah. Just because I was more receptive to music <laughs> and not a jaded old prick like I am <laughs> yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, um, it was exciting. It was like, I feel like it was one thing kind of led to another over the years, and then um, I think it gave you time to kind of ab- absorb different genres and styles and, you know, mm-hmm. um, cause I feel like metal led to like punk and grunge. And then, mm-hmm. then, you, you know, we were talking about the fireside when I got here. It's like, then it was the fireside like, bowl. Yeah. It was like from that point and you just like discover, I mean, I spent so much time there and it's emo, indie, experimental, like, anything goes pretty much at that place. When did you start playing drums? Pretty late. Um, so I, I started going to sh- my first shows probably around 15. And that's when it was like, it really clicked where, I, you know, um, it went from like, Oh, I'm sitting in my room just listening to music and I'm like, paying attention to these songs like, intensely. And then I was like going to shows gravitating to watching the drummers. Um, I mean, obviously watching the whole band, I have a ton of respect for, anyone who could play any in, in, instrument. I would love to learn how to play guitar at some point, but it was like, at that point, I just was like fixated on drummers. So um, when I was 16, I, I remember asking my folks for a drum kit for, for Christmas. And sure enough, they got me this like Royce kit. I mean, it was like, I think they got it for like 200 bucks and, you know, it might've been, well, it was like, been like cardboard you know it was like pretty bare bones but um it was cool i was stoked i didn't know anything really about drums at that point so i was just like happy to have a kit and they let me put in my room and can um, you remember the feeling you got when you had it set up in your room and you started playing oh yeah i just thought it was the coolest thing and my brother who you know we we both lived up we um lived upstairs and he had to walk through my room to get to his room um, that was the deal. It was like I had the bigger room, but he had the more private room with like the, the doors that could close. But anyways, he was already playing guitar at that point, way before me. So it, it was cool in a way because we would we bonded kind of on that. Where like, oh, now he's got a drum kit in his room. And is your brother older than you? He's younger. He had like two and a half years. And he's got into music before you. Totally. Yeah, way before he was like, um, you know, he, he got into art early probably because my dad like drawing and painting and one and then uh did you get into visual art as well i did i i really liked um art and i liked photography um i just uh i wasn't very good at it you know um and then brian uh i, I think saxophone was his first um instrument when he was like in eighth grade mm-hmm. and then from that point he he started playing guitar you know, from like junior high into high school. So you figure I'm like, I'm like kind of picking up my first kid at like junior year of high school, you know? So I'm, I was pretty late to the game. Did you feel insecure about that? Oh, sure. Definitely. Um, and I think that probably has to do with some of those early shows we were talking about in, earlier in the... Did you ever see Phone? Oh, sure. Yeah. Ryan Rapsy. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> that, oh, yeah. That was he, my favorite drummer in Chicago oh, during that era. Oh, he's rad. Yeah. He lives out here now. I, I actually listened to your podcast with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's awesome. He's the best. He's so great. A, a real original. Um, but anyway, uh, when did it start clicking with you? Like, did, did the instrument make sense to you when you sat down at it? I probably really didn't start playing seriously till I was like 18 or 19. It took me a couple of years of just kind of like messing around here and there, trying to figure stuff out. Um, when you say playing seriously, what does that entail for you? For me, I mean, and again, this is like at 19, it was like, oh, I'm going to play every day for at least two hours a day. I'm going to lock myself in my room. And were you still living at home at that point? Yeah, probably yeah. driving my, driving my parents crazy. Um, cause I was at community college at that point. Um, so I was going to school local. I kept weird hours. Like I would go to class, come home in the mid afternoon, play for a couple hours. And then I'd go work a night shift. You know, I had a bunch of like crappy jobs, like 
delivering pizzas. I worked at a gas station for a while, you know, just just stuff to make some money to get through um, college and maybe buy some drum gear, you know? What were you studying? Um, so at that point, it was just like liberal arts. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, my parents were just kind of like, you got to go to school. You got to get a degree. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I don't really know what I want to do, but this seems okay for now. So I, I, did, I did community college for two years and then transferred to UIC and got a degree in sociology mm -hmm. and considered social work and then um, didn't, didn't pursue it. Why not? Uh, partially because of music. Um, by the time, because it took me a while to get through college just because I was like, I took a year off in the middle and the, um, then I would take like some years at like less classes than the other years. So it was like part-time, full-time, part-time, full-time. And anyways, get my degree at like 20, 23 or 24, I think I finished. And at that point, um, Pelican was like starting to kind of get busy in Chicago. We were playing like, every month and there was starting to be a demand to play out of town um i had worked at whole foods like through the the later part of college so i just kind of kept that job um for like flexibility and there at that point this is like however many years ago like 20 years ago but they um were cool about touring and everyone there was like into art or music and yeah maybe it was less of a kind of strict corporate structure back oh, for then. Sure. Yeah. My, my suit, my like boss, I had to like, you know, respond to for stuff. He, I mean, he was like the stereotypical hippie, right. And the dreadlocks and wouldn't shower and smell like uh, what's that stuff. Patchouli. Exactly. You know? So, the, and it was just like, I think his name was Dave, Dave. Um, can I leave for like a week? I'm gonna go play these shows out of town. Yeah, man, it's cool. It's, cool. It's, it's all good. It's all good. And right. then it like got to the point where like, Dave, can I leave for like a month? You know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then finally he's like, you're kind of gone a lot. You might need to like go to seasonal status because mm -hmm. you're, start you're starting to be on a lot. And he was, but he was still super cool about it. And like, I remember that kind of being the turning point in like 2005, maybe. Would you get all of your food from Whole Foods at I that did. point? Yeah. How deep was the discount? Or did people well, just take food home? Well, so they wouldn't take, I mean, I'm sure people took food home. Um, there was this thing called the write-off system where anything that was like slightly damaged, you could take for like a quarter. So mm -hmm. if a cereal box had a dent in it or a can had a dent in it. So would people uh, like damage stuff on purpose? Uh, I think some people did that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to not, I tried to be pretty honest about it, but um, I definitely like, got so many groceries for like nothing for years. And then they finally like, were like, all right, we're getting rid of that. Yeah. You know, even though they're like, now they're like dumping. Oh, they all dump so dumpsters. much. I, it's I like, have friends that dumpster dive there. Yeah. It's like, why not let your employees just take it home? And I don't, it's, it's whatever corporate mentality, but, um, well, I, at least the prices are affordable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The Trap Set will always be available for free, but we rely on donations from our listeners. Please visit our website at thetrapset.net and click donate. Subscribe to our show on iTunes. And if you enjoy what you hear, give us a review. When you were 19, yes. you decided to become more serious. Yeah. What changed? Um, I, so I lived, in the, I lived in the city briefly. Um, I took a year off of school, lived walking distance to the fireside, and... Um, I just started like going there constantly, made a bunch of friends, met the Pelican guys there. Um, and it was just like, I just knew like this th music was becoming super important to me. 
more like more so than ever. And I was like, why am I not doing this more often? Why am I not? It, this brings a uh, pleasure and joy and happiness, you know, into my life. And like, it would be awesome to be in a band. And you know, all these guys in bands who are like, you know, I think like at that point um, when I was 19, like Laurent and Trevor, they were in, they're in Pelican, you know, they were already in like five other bands and it didn't matter if like you were great or this like super precise musician. It was just kind of like, Oh, you're doing this band this week or, you know, we're going to try this, we're going to try this kind of music. And it's just so many people I knew were just like getting involved in all these different kind of um, styles. And yeah, it's partially <clears throat> just a way to connect to other people, yeah, which yeah. is kind of music's primary function to begin with. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, when did you start feeling confident enough to put yourself out there and start <laughs> playing in bands? Um, I was trying to remember, uh, you know, and I'm probably not going to have. So I remember. Uh, so Pete, Pete Wentz, you know, Fall Out Boy. Uh huh. Right? Um, I'm pretty sure it was like his parents' place, or somebody in his one of his old bands. Uh, um, they were doing another band with this guy Dan Benai and uh, Tim Marola. I'm trying to remember all the guys at that point. Andy Hurley. He, he was around then, yeah. But this he, was he was in Race Trader, exactly. And he's from Milwaukee. I was in a yeah. drum line with him in, when I was growing up. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I, I know Andy. F- um, I mean, we're like acquaintances, but yeah. Um, I don't know if they were do, doing Race Trader with Andy yet. Because before they had an early version with a different with Carl, I think was playing drums, and I think Carl was like going to play guitar in this other band. Anyways, long story short, I went to like I brought my kit to one of their houses on like the North Shore and set up, and we like tried to like play together, and it and it was not good on probably on my part, you know, because I I never played in a band, I never tried out for a band, just clueless, you know. But uh, I think it kind of like got me just to, like you need to go home and work on your, your shit, you know? And then probably it was like a year later, I was at a festival, um, out in Columbus. But I, I, I think I was driving out with Laurent from Pelican and we were going to this festival and, um, I, he like got there and he, this girl from Canada that he'd been like pen pals with was there. And like, he just like left with this girl and I was just like on my own. And Trevor happened to be there too. He drove out for the fest. He's, also from Chicago. And, um, I just ended up started talking to him a lot and we were talking about MK ultra and his hero's gone and Acme and all these like old, like mid to late nineties, like fast hardcore bands. And we're like, we should do a band when we get back. And I was like, yeah, I'd love to, I, you know? And that was kind of how we started Tusk. Mm-hmm. And then, so like the ride back was tell I'm filling in Laurent who was like spent the weekend with this girl. I was like, Hey, it's like me and Trevor like really hit it off this weekend. Like we want to we want to start a band. He's like, oh, I'll play bass, and it was just like that was it. We just like we're all friends and like put it together, and you know, I mean, it wasn't good for Did a long time. Did it feel like it was good though, in, in the sense that it yeah, was I mean, fun and, and oh, sure. you were into it. Yeah, I mean, they started coming over every weekend, and you know, after probably like half a year we like made a demo and it was like i remember thinking it was so cool because we like went to this i this guy pat um i can't remember his last name he had this like really dumpy studio on belmont in like a basement and there was like this like i remember this huge furnace being there and you couldn't do a take when the furnace was on (laughs) so you had to like time it so you'd be like okay the furnace off go yeah like you know we're all playing live these like one minute songs but uh, we, I just remember thinking it was like the coolest thing. I'm like, I'm in the city and this is my first band and a demo. And yeah, but it's important <clears throat> to try to preserve that feeling as you keep going along. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's hard. It gets hard to kind of preserve that excitement from when everything is new or to, to try to keep adding new elements to yeah. your life or trying to, you know, keep pushing so that you can still feel that way. Yeah. I think starting a new band will do that. Yeah. <laughs> I've, you know, I've, I've had a few other bands since Pelican's been going and I feel like, ah, oh, it's always like, I think it's going to be like this, like it's going to be as easy as like Pelican was. And it's like never really the case. Like Interceptor is like my newest thing. And we've played like 
10 shows around and more than half of them have been to like a few people if that you know it's like it's, back yeah. to the beginning again you know <laughs> you're like i'm gonna take all of my fan base with me and yeah. build on that for this new thing <laughs> definitely not oh man <laughs> <laughs> I think that's partially a product of the fact that live music is just not as popular as it used to be or any kind of live art or entertainment options. Yeah. It's too easy to stay home. I, especially in LA. I think that's... It's overwhelming to go out here sometimes. Yeah. I feel like in Chicago, it wasn't that way. I I mean, obviously it was a different time when I lived there, but um, you know, the weather's way worse in Chicago and... Mm -hmm. Oh, oh yeah. Neurosis is playing the fireside, but there's a blizzard. Like, oh yeah. Who cares? We're going to see Neurosis, you know, or whatever. And it was like, it didn't matter. Here it's like, you know, like it's raining today, and it's like, it's like the city like shuts down. Like everyone freaks out, and like guys, it's rain. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew that I was a Los Angelino when I started getting cold when it was like 50 degrees outside. Yeah. It took me a few years. I used years. to laugh about that. Yeah. So when you got into this kind of serious place with music, yeah. what was your approach to getting better? Did you play along with records? Did you do exercises? Did you take lessons? <laughs> like, how did you um, approach it? So I tried to take a lesson. I was trying to remember the name of the place. I think it was called Minstrel Music. And it was like the next town over in like Niles. Um, my brother took guitar lessons there. So I'm like, oh, they do drum lessons there. Like maybe, maybe I'll try that. And it was probably around 18 or 19. And, um, I remember going in there and sitting down with whoever the guy was and he was just such a dick. It, like immediately, you know, like I sat down and he's like, just play for me. And I started playing and he's just like, oh man, you're doing this wrong and you're not even sitting right and you're dead. And it's just like, I was like, fuck this. You know, I never went back. Doesn't sound like a very good teacher. No, it's terrible. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I think back, I'm like, like 18, like you're still pretty young, you know? And like, clearly like hadn't been playing that long. And it's like, that's why I'm here, dickhead. Like, you know, I'm like, I don't know. It was just like, yeah. you, rub me the wrong way. And, um, it kind of put me off for a little while. And then I tried a private lesson mm -hmm. and I was trying to remember that guy's name and I don't remember his name, but he came, he came to my parents' house a few times um and he was helpful you know he helped me like kind of work on you know technique and he gave me some like very like early like remedial like exercises you know paradiddles and like that's you know that kind of stuff rudiments and um he like i said he came like four or five times and then like uh one day he just like stopped answering his phone and i don't know what i was like i, I was like did he die like <laughs> I know it sounds terrible, but like that's really crazy. Yeah, maybe like he, he did. Just, like I never heard from him again. It was and really you never strange. heard anything about him again. No, and I've been trying to think of his name for years, and I cannot for the life of me remember this guy or like how I even found him. I don't even remember. Um, maybe he was never real. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, what was the impetus to start a second band when you when you guys got Pelican together? Um, so. Laurent was the bassist in Tusk and he was going, he was at Northwestern, um, living in the city. I started going to UIC and his roommate, Matthew is his name. He went to study abroad. So he wanted somebody to take his room for like eight months or something like that. And I was like, Oh, this will make my commute much easier. And I can live with Laurent. We're like in a band together and it'd be fun. And anyway, so we like lived together and, um, one day, uh, you know, I was going to USD and then working at Whole Foods at night and I'd come home kind of late and I came home late one night and he was sitting in my room with his guitar, guitar out. I thought you were going to say he was sitting in my room with his penis out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wouldn't put it past him. It's something he probably would do, but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, he was out, he was out with his clothes on and his guitar out cause he was playing a lot of bass at that point, but he was originally a guitar player and he was trying to tune his guitar to um, the first Goat's Neck record, which uh, Greg had a pretty like low drop tuning B or something. I don't even know what it is. I don't play guitar, but anyways, he's trying to tune his guitar and he's like, he's like, oh, sorry, I'm in your room. I'm just, I'm trying to get this 
this drop tuning and um, hey, can I play you something? I, I kind of wrote this song and he like goes out into the living room. He's got this little like crate, little amp and he like plugs in and he started strumming Mammoth, which is like our first song we ever wrote. And it's like essentially like two parts. It's like a super meat and potato song, but people really like it for whatever, you know. But, um, anyways, he started playing that and I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. Like, and he's like, well, what if, what if uh, next weekend when we're practicing at your, your folks' house, we try and do do something like this after we're done with uh, Tusk practice. And I'm like, yeah, it sounds cool. Because at that point I was like starting to get into like the Melvins and, you know, Sleep at that point had already, I think, done Jerusalem, which became the, the Dope Smoker thing, the hour long song. And so we were kind of like getting into slower, more repetitive stuff. And um, Mammoth was like I said, it was like two parts just like looped. And, uh, were you smoking weed at the time? We were smoking weed at the time. Did yes. you get it from your boss at Whole Foods? Um, where did I get the weed from? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, it was like, I think like so many of our friends yeah. smoked pot. So it was just like, it was just kind of always around. Yeah. Um, and if I, if memory is correct, I think, I think that weekend that I'm talking about when we tried, my parents were actually out of town that weekend. So I think we went back on Friday night and started working on this Pelican thing. And then the next morning when Trevor showed up for test practice, we showed him like, you check this out. And we started playing it and he's like, I want in on that. That's cool. That's, that's like, that's really cool. What you guys are doing. And then, so he just started like playing over it. And then, I mean, we but got it my felt like involved. that project had a distinct mission statement from Tusk from the beginning. Well, yeah. I mean, it was just like stylistically so different, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, like went from super fast, short songs to really, really long, repetitive songs with like lots of riffs and just kind of, the other extreme of uh, heavy music. And it was stuff we all liked, you know, like I was saying, like, you know, we, we liked Napalm Death and all these other like bands growing up and then getting into our twenties was like, we we're like ex discovering all this other music that was really cool. And so we like kind of wanted to explore that and it, you know, brought us to where we are now. And then we got my brother involved and you know, that was like really easy cause he was still living at home and he had, he had gear there and then he didn't know how to play bass, but he played guitar and Laurent was like, well, here, just take my bass and you can be our bass so player. So they just did the switcheroo. And Brian just like started winging bass and, and we just like spent like a year writing songs. Before was your that. brother still in high school? Um, so he's two and a half years behind. I think he might've just finished if I'm remembering. Cause like we were probably 20, one twenty one, twenty two ish when we started. Pelican. Had you and your brother played together a lot before then? I wouldn't say a lot, but like occasionally we would like just mess around and um I like have this memory of like trying to me and me and him trying to play the a song from the fir their very first Queens of the Stone Age record, the the self titled one. Um I can't remember the name of the song, but just being in the room like just trying to play it together before just like way before pelican it's probably like 98 or 97 98 if i have the timeline right but um he was you know he was skating he was like a skater too and like he had you know he had his own group of friends and like he he did a couple bands too i'm not i don't remember the names of them but they were like local bands with guys he went to high school with and i remember one of them like i think they only played one show like brian sang and played guitar I remember going to the show and like they kind of reminded me of Sunny Day Real Estate and thinking it was like really cool and I was like super proud of them. But they like only played like one show and then I don't know, they like went on to form other bands and Brian ended up playing with us. And yeah, how would you describe your brotherly dynamic? Oh, we get along great. Uh, he lives here now. Um, I'm going to see him after this. We're going to go play for a couple hours. Um, it was definitely not always like great i mean we definitely had a um some rocky moments uh especially in the band mm -hmm. um 2009 ish was like we had like a big big like blowout and we didn't talk for a while what was it over um i mean it was a combination of a lot of things i think that was probably the roughest year for the band and all four of us were kind of like 
I mean, I, I truthfully thought we were going to break up. And it was like, me and Brian weren't getting along. Um, Laurent was like ready to bail on the band because he was like ready to be at home and start a family. Um, Trevor, Trevor was dealing with his mom dying back home. So he was kind of like in his own headspace. And it was just, it was just weird. It was like, and that was like our peak touring. We were touring like half the year trying to make a living off the band and we were just burned out, probably drinking too much. And, uh, so yeah, it was just a lot of like fighting and just like, I think we kind of like lost track of like why we were like probably doing it because we weren't in, enjoying it as much at that point. So what did you do to move forward as a group? Uh, well, Laurent and Laurent ended up pulling out, uh, it's probably like the following year. It's like 2010. We played two shows the whole year. We did our 10 year anniversary shows, like one in LA, one in Chicago. And then he just is kind of like showing less and less interest. And it was like, I was trying to like, come on guys, let's do this and let's do this. And we were still getting offers and it was like, it just wasn't happening. Um, so, uh, Dallas, that's around when Dallas came on board. Like, um, I'm trying to remember the timeline, but we, I went back to play a, a Chicago show. I think it was probably our last, last show with Laurent and, um, Dallas's other band at the time was playing the show too. So we kind of like befriended him and he was literally practicing in the next practice space over from us. So we could hear him in there like shredding. We're like, dude, what is that? Who is that guy? Oh, this Dallas from the Swan King. Um, and, uh, everyone like Sanford included the guy we've recorded with a bunch was like vouch for Dallas. He's like, Oh, he's rad. You know, you guys should hook up with him." And so we like befriended Dallas and, you know, we're like, Hey, do you want to like come jam with us? We, th we think he might be a good fit. And Laurent seems like he's not really, I mean, we, we have an open door with Laurent, but it, at this point it's been years now. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and we just, we brought Dallas in and it was a kind of like instant, uh, instant fit because Dallas like was really respectful to like the old material. He like tried to play it like how Laurent did. Um, and he's a very schooled musician and, uh, he just jumped right in he was ready to be busy and it just it took us a couple of years to kind of pick up momentum again. How did you and your brother kind of oh, move that. to the next place? Um, I'm trying to remember. I think it was just kind of like a slow process of talking it out uh, and being like, I, you know, I wish I could remember how how we figured it out. But it just kind of like over time, we just kind of worked it out. And mm -hmm. he he lived in L.A. for a while, and then he he broke up with his girlfriend, moved back to Chicago for a few years. Um, I think that around that point he was back in Chicago. And then I was, I was the only one here making these trips back to Chicago to see the family and the band. And I think at that point we kind of just started to like work it out and probably like miss being around each other. We weren't touring as much. He was not in LA anymore. You know, he was here for a few years and then now he wasn't. Um, and now he's back. Why did you move here? Uh, we both we both left in 2006 to um, pretty much just get out of the Chicago weather and change of pace. Uh, you know, I was like 29. I kind of felt like if I don't go now, I never will. Mm -hmm. The band at that point was at a good point. We were touring a lot. We were like actually making okay money. So we're like, oh, we can be in a different city and we're going to be on tour half the year anyways. So it doesn't really matter. 
So we kind of just wing, like winged it. We're like, let's just let's try live in LA. And like Hydrahead was our label at the time. They were already out here. And so we had like a nice little network of label and band people that we knew. So it was really easy to kind of like come here and just, you know, get into LA. Cause I know LA is like tough for some people when they come here, they don't know anybody. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was nice having like a little music community already established. Um, so yeah, it was just like, uh, we had had enough of Chicago. I think, I think that winter was brutal. If I remember the, br- the, the winter, um, crossing over into 2006 i mm-hmm. think it was like really bad and it's like i can't do another winter here <laughs> it's just miserable you know and like i always i used to get so sick in the winter time yeah it's just like depressing yeah. depressing yeah seasonal depression for sure do you get seasonal depression here i think i do a little bit not like how i did in chicago though yeah i'd agree um i think it's yeah milwaukee As somebody right? who grew up in milwaukee yeah, yeah. I, I i definitely like catch myself feeling like kind of in a funk sometimes, but, um, I think like the sun's out most of the time that helps. And Do you have tools to get yourself out of a funk? Running really helps. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Like, that's, are you serious? Well, I'm starting to be again. I had a, I had a back injury a few years ago that kind of took me out of it for a while. And I was scared to run cause I didn't want to like go react activate the i had like whiplash in my spine and wow. i have like my l5s kind of like smashed in so, a car accident uh no <laughs> running actually oh yeah I, I was running in the hills um in griffith park and um i was following aaron aaron harris he, he's yeah. a tr- drummer too and we, we were drummer buddies and um, my friend steven was there too and we were at that point we were running like three or four times a week up in the mountains you know like these kind of crazy like 45 minute all incline runs you know like i used to run that route when i lived in los Feliz. yeah awesome yeah, yeah i lived there when i went, met my wife and i loved it over there yeah me too it's so expensive but yeah yeah I, I mean i need to hit it big before i buy a house over there <laughs> <laughs> hit me up i do real estate too <laughs> you do yeah that's my so, other thing yeah so when did you get into that um 2013 around when I met my wife, um, reconnected with, it's funny cause my roommate going back to all the fireside stories from when I was like 1920, I lived with a guy named Ed who is a broker out here. So he was my roommate when we were like 20, he's been doing a real estate company out here for, um, probably a decade now. And, uh, I ran into him at a coffee shop in Echo Park and, he was like, Hey, Larry, what are you doing? And I, I was, I remember I was there with Chris Common actually. And we were talking about doing the forever becoming record. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we we're about to get ready to mix it or something. Anyways, we we're just like going to grab coffee and Ed was like, Hey, you know, what are you up to? Come sit down. And like me and Chris went and sat down and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing the same shit I've been doing for 14 years, uh, working at Whole Foods and playing in bands, <laughs> you know? And oh, he, you're working at Whole Foods here too. Yeah. I was like, so basically when I came out here in 06, I was still seasonal mm-hmm. and they let me just transfer my status. And, uh, to maintain your employment, you just had to work one day a year and every day you'd work, it would start the 12 month cycle over again. And so we were still touring a lot till about 2010. And that's when I had to go back to work full time. And so I just like basically asked for my job back and, um, was like a cashier for like, another you know three or four years and it was miserable it felt demoralizing to go back to doing something that you did when oh, you were trying to lift off my god in your early 20s yeah like talk about like like oh i'm moving to la like this things are looking great and the band's doing well and like this this is so rad from like the the kid that was like sitting in his room in the burbs like you know hoping to maybe play in a band one day is like some somehow i'm like in, in los angeles now in a touring band and you know uh, and then it was just like, bloop, here you are back. You're, you're th- in your thirties, you're cashiering. Uh, I mean, nothing against cashiers, but it's just like, I had already done that. And it's like, you're rec- kind of feel like you're regressing back and it's, it hurt. Yeah. Yeah. It hurt your pride. <laughs> Fuck yeah, man. I was, I was bitter, uh-huh. you know? And how did that manifest at the time? I mean, 
it, it's still like, I was still super motivated with music. I mean, I definitely wasn't like the happiest period of my life, but it made me like, like I didn't want to waste any time. Which one were you working at? The West Hollywood one. The one over by the farmer's market. Yeah. Fairfax and Santa Monica. Yeah. Well, no, the, not the one down by third. Oh yeah. Okay. That's the one by the farmer's market. Okay. Yeah. 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 The one uh, further up closer to like Runyon Canyon. So anyway, then you ran into your old roommate who had a real estate company. Yep. Yeah. And he was just kind of like, Hey, why don't you, why don't you stop doing that and come work for me? And I was like, well, I don't really know anything about real estate. He's like, well, I didn't either. When I first started, I'll teach you everything you need to know. I'll show you the classes you gotta take. You can come to my office next week and we'll sit down. And, and he was doing pretty well at that point. Yeah. I mean, he was a broker already, um, had his own office. It's a boutique office, but, um, yeah, he was doing well, like nice house in Laurel Canyon, you know, supporting, it. you know, he's got two kids and wife, like nice cars, the whole thing, you know, he's, he's doing great. Um, so I was like, man, this sounds really cool. Like Ed's an old friend from the music scene. He knows I play in bands, but this is like my ticket out of retail, you know, like, and he, you know, you're just retailing something else, <laughs> different inventory. <laughs> Yeah, but it was just like it was just like something new, and it it was like a challenge, and uh, so yeah, I just went and had that meeting, and then he got me started in classes. I started interning there, got my license. Now I'm on like starting year six of it. Hmm. So it's why cool. do you think he offered that to you? He told me that was one of the things he told me when I told him I didn't know anything about real estate. He was like, "Oh, he's like, you know how to talk to people, and you're like approachable." And people like you. And I was like, oh, thanks, man. That's really nice. And he's like, no, he's like, that's like half the battle is like, are you a social person? And like, you know, can you talk to people? And, and you know, as I've got into that business, I realized that is like a huge part of it is like sure. communication. It's a and huge like, part of any business. Well, sure. And totally. I feel like the skills that you developed as a musician, and I'm not talking about necessarily the playing part, but the whole picture of, of sustaining a career as a musician oh, yeah. are transferable. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really hard yeah. to be a musician who supports himself playing music. Oh, totally. So maybe he saw that too. You know, it's like, if you can make it in the music business, yeah, then you can probably do something else too. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's like you said, I think you, you gain a, a level of confidence too, like playing, cause you're like, you're playing on stage, you build up this kind of confidence in yourself. You're like, cause you're, Put it on a nightly basis, you're putting yourself out in front of people uh, to judge, you know? When did you sell your first house? Uh, it was the end of my first year with my license where I was contemplating not doing it anymore. <laughs> so you had tried selling all year and then... Oh, yeah, it was the first... I mean, I think if you, if you talk to any agent and they're being honest with you, like the first year is always, it's hard. You're figuring out how to like just the industry, you know, how do you make this work? And you don't make money until you make that sale. It's all commission based. And, uh, so I spent 12 months kind of spinning my wheels and, uh, you know, hours and hours of taking people to see places and them not buying or changing their mind. And, and it was like, so it was like a 12 months into it. And I'm like, I have spent thousands of dollars uh, getting this in motion between school and gas and your membership to the, the, in the, the, um, you have to basically like buy a, a membership, with the MLS and Baglar, which is like a also association that like represents your office in case you get into like legal stuff. Um, you have to just pay all these dues. And so like by the end of the first year, I was like, man, this is, this is not, going well. well. I'm sure lots of people quit at oh, that time. Totally. I'm sure there's a, I'm sure we could Google there's right now. There's a huge drop off probably. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it was like, I re, and I remember it was just, it was like December of like the end of that year. Cause I got my license in January and I was just like, man, I don't know if this is going to work anymore. This is like wasting my time and money. And I'm, I was, you know, were you still working at Whole Foods too? At I that was, point? I was like splitting my days up crazy. I was, still playing in bands too. So it was like, I was running on low fumes. You know what I mean? I was like up, up at six in the morning, doing my reading, interning at the office, going to Whole Foods in the evening, trying to go to band practice. It was like, it was a lot. And then finally that 12th month I hit that sale and it was, 
it was funny because it was a really unique sale. It was like a, a house that had been on market for a long time. And it was a, a friend of a friend who I had this coffee date with. And then I didn't hear from him for six months. So I didn't even really know if he was my client or not. And he just hit me up out of the blue. Hey, Larry, I, I've been looking at this house. It's kind of weird, but I think we want to offer on it. And I remember looking it up and being like, oh, man, that's like, it looked like a bomb went off inside of it. You know, it was just just shattered, a shattered house, but he saw the potential in it. And, uh, we, I eventually got the offer accepted and (laughs) sold the house and they've like totally renovated, remodeled the house. And now they have a kid there and it's awesome. Like totally worked out for him and it kept me in it. Do you get the same kind of enjoyment, um, from real estate as you do from playing music? Um, I mean, I guess there's like some gambling factor to it mm-hmm. uh, that causes anxiety. Uh, you know, does it excite you too? I feel like there's gambling to music. Oh, for I mean, sure. It's basically gambling your whole life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, even just like on a sh- on a night to night basis, you're like, I want to oh, play yeah. awesome tonight, and then maybe you don't have a good night, and yeah. you're like, I and fucking blew that totally. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I mean, I just think about that more now because I. I made my first album on my own and I just paid for it all myself and I'm getting it mixed. And then, then I'm going to see if anybody wants to put it out, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And I think someone will, I'm proud of it, but it's like, well, maybe nobody will ever listen to this. (laughs) (laughs) So, but do you get the same kind of connection with people that you do from playing music? I think, well, I've been lucky in that I have a lot of the deals I have, worked on have been um friends or friends of a friend or you know my wife's friends so it's like people semi close to me and um it is a good feeling when you get it done and like they're in the house and then like you can go back to it a year later and they're having a party and their kids are there and you know it's like that part of it is really satisfying um some of the behind the scenes stuff is not satisfying and can be really um stressful Mm -hmm. you know especially if i'm i've represented a few friends and i tend to take that those deals a little more personal Mm -hmm. when an agent on the other side's maybe not being um a good person or fair right Right. so uh i've had some like really stressful almost like mental breakdown type moments and it's just because i'm like you get protective of your friends well it's good that you're emotionally invested oh for sure yeah Probably like more than I should be because like you meet some of these other agents and they're just like, they just don't they give two it's shits. Just numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't necessarily want to be like those people either. No. But I like having after, balance, you know. But now that you've been doing it for a while, you know, you said that first year you almost quit and then you had a breakthrough. So what have you learned about your job that makes it more sustainable for you now? I mean, I think, I think I just every deal I learned something kind of new about it and it, it makes it the next one a little easier. There's so much uncertainty in the first couple of years. And, um, I, it's just kind of like, I, I mean, it is like drums. I, I feel like I was just kind of like, I'm just like kind of figuring it out as I go mm-hmm. and uh, just winging it. And, um, but I, I mean, I think it's made me, um, more, uh, well, it's like, I have a family now. That's a, a yeah. big difference. So it's like, I have more invested in in that career than I did when I was like just working a retail job at Whole Foods where I was sure. like, it's like, yeah, this is a paycheck for my shitty car and my stupid apartment that I don't care about. Yeah. And now it's like, Oh, I have a wife and kid and there's like a lot more at stake. So I just take it. I take life more serious in that way. Now. Um, I think it's helped, uh, probably my confidence level, um, just learning about myself you mean having a kid or having a kid and doing real estate? It was like yeah. all like right around the same time. You mean it, it's helped in the sense that you went into a field that you knew absolutely nothing about and yeah. have turned it into a viable career for yourself. Yeah. And how has it changed your relationship with music now that you have this steady stream of income from something else? Well, I wouldn't say it's steady. <laughs> that's the thing about real estate. It's definitely not steady. And that's something I had to learn and, yeah. and deal with too, is like the first couple of years, like, oh, here's this like really big paycheck. And then, oh, the next one's not coming for like months, yeah. you know, unless you have a couple fall in place right after each other. And you're like, oh, this is great. Um, I lost my train of thought. But, but how has it changed your relationship to music? Oh, music. So it's like, 
I feel like it's um it's allowed me more more time in a way where um, I've learned to balance my schedule a little bit where I'm kind of like, okay, so this is what I have to do today. I have to do a, maybe, maybe a showing here or there, stop in the office for a little while. I know I got to pick up my son by 5.30. I definitely have like a block of three hours, like mid-afternoon. I can go to the practice space and like work on some stuff. Or um, I can be on the road and still do a deal. You know, so much of real estate now is online. You, you have all these apps like DocuSign and stuff where you can like, I, I was in El Paso playing a show with Pelican and I was literally like closing a, a deal like simultaneously away, you know, remote. And um, so it's like you can, I can be away and like still have this career happening in, in Los Angeles and like have money uh, when I get home. And uh, I can enjoy the music part a little bit more because it's like, like I was saying, like by 2009, we were all like burnt out and we we're trying to tour to make a living and you know, it was like, we were just like shooting ourselves in the foot kind of. And now so it's now like, you don't have that pressure where the band has to be your sole source of exactly. Income. Yeah. It's like, it's like this, if we make money, cool. Um, if we break even fine, it's not our, um, primary source of income anymore, you know, and Dallas has a kid, Trevor is about to have his second kid, you know, so we all have other jobs and, but I think it's really made us like, really enjoy uh the band again and like i definitely take it more serious now i don't take it for granted anymore i kind of when we're touring all the time i sort of just take it for granted like right and then um when it was taken away i was like oh shit you know and then i was trying to put these other bands together that were you know not really taking off the way i wanted them to and then so that made you recognize that there was something special about the chemistry that you have with 100 percent in pelican yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, we probably only play like um, a couple weeks of shows a year, but I, I value them more now. They're like way more exciting and I cherish them more. And I'm just getting older, so it's kind of like you don't know how many more years you got. You know, the band's You're not almost that fucking old, man. <laughs> well, the band's like almost 20 years old, so it's yeah. kind of like it's you know how you don't. I just don't want to take it for granted. Yeah, it's like That's one of true, those things yeah. where you know we've already had a few hiccups and speed mm -hmm. bumps over the years, and it's like. Hopefully this new record that comes out in spring will be well, well received and we're going to do some touring in summer, which I'm already looking forward to. You know, what's interesting is it, it, I think about why do bands break up, you know, and it seems like in some cases people need to put a definitive end on something so they can move on, on with their lives. Mm -hmm. But it's, it almost seems like the way that you guys are now, you're basically family you're you're like tied together yeah in a way that's deeper than like whether or not the band is active so it's kind of like you could just not do it for a while and then pick it up again years later if you wanted to yeah i think definitely we have a very tight bond with the band members um i also think we got kind of lucky as far as like when we established the band because i think i don't know if like we started pelican like today i don't know if it would people would grab on the way they did at that time. And I just think it, do you think there's anything that you guys did to encourage people to grab on? Like, or was it just a matter of being in the right time with that music? I think it, I think it was a lot of timing. I mean, like I said, that first show was Brian Peterson's like, I don't have a stone or rock band to play the high end fire show. I, mm -hmm. you guys have Sabbath thrifts, like come, you know, come play, come play the show with, you know, and he, he didn't know who we were. So I think mm -hmm. it's like, that was kind of like right, right band at the right time. There was no, from my memory, there was no band in Chicago. I mean, other than like maybe Tortoise who was doing like, in, like, you know, kind of successful indie rock instrumental music. Um, but in a, in a heavy way, I mean, there's not Caballero obviously, but they're what they're Pitts, from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh yeah. yeah. Uh, I just don't think I was, I, and I was yeah. trying to rack my brain. I don't think there were any other Chicago bands at that time. 
Sometimes I wonder if there's really much that a band can do to become financially successful. Can you actually engineer that? Or is it completely up to chance? And I was thinking about it because I recently interviewed Ian Mackay, yeah. um, who's somebody who engineered his own life. Yeah. Uh, you know, started a couple of really cool bands and a label. Yeah. And has been, from an outside perspective, been very successful for 40 years. <laughs> Definitely. And, you know, he, he kind of... My conversation with him was, was like trying to get to the bottom of, you know, what his unique talents are that other people just don't have and yeah. his unique charisma and just his business sense that most of people that are creative minded don't necessarily have. Yeah. And then trying to figure out like how much of it is up to luck and how much of it is up to hard work. And are those two things even distinct from one another? Because some people are just harder working by nature yeah. you know, or by circumstance. So yeah, it's just something I think about. Do you have an opinion on it? I think they both work together. Yeah. I mean, when I think back to all, all the years and all the shit that happened and I definitely wasn't like not working hard, you know, I, I think we got lucky. I mean, pretty like kind of a weird band when I, when I think about it, you know, it's pretty yeah. unconventional to have any sort of like success, mm -hmm. you know, even if it was just touring full time for a few years, even was like, feels really special to be able to do because I I don't think any of us ever thought that would that would happen, but um, I think the luck and the hard work. Yeah, it's like it's a good combo. They go hand and, in hand. Yeah, I mean, and I feel like you. It's hard to uh, you know sustain hard work without a little bit of luck or like a little you know certain things have to kind of go your way to keep you going. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I just think about it a lot. <laughs> Um, I'm glad we're not starting now. <laughs> just uh, you know, it's a it's a different time. You yeah. know, it's like we got to rise up in the whole. It was like this, you know, the the DIY scene, and then it was like I remember MySpace kind of like kicking off for a yeah. while, and we yeah. like kind of rode that yeah a bit. And um, I mean, Biz Three was our publicist back then. They like did such a great job in the those early years for us. I feel like that really helped us like get on the map. Well, anyway. I think that's a good place to end it. Yeah. Was there anything else that you wanted to discuss? No, I mean, I just, thanks for having me on. I, I love the show. Uh, I listen to it all the time. You've had some of my favorite drummers on here. So it's, it's really special for me to be on here. Well, uh, thank you. It's really yeah. special to have you on. Awesome. Larry Herwig, thank you for being on the thank show. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Trap Set.